Acts 4, 32 to 37. The believers share their possessions. All the believers were in one heart and mind, and no one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them and brought the money for the, from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to everyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Amen. Thank you, Robin. Well, we continue to look at our uh, current theme of some of the core principles of our midweek group. So we're a church here at Emmanuel that meets on a Sunday, which you're obviously aware of because you're here. Uh, but we're also a church that meets during the week. We have midweek groups that go on. They've in the past been called life groups, home groups. Uh, but we're having a bit of a rebrand at the moment, and we're trying to uh, instill some some values, some principles into our midweek groups. And we're calling these new midweek groups grow groups. And they've been, uh, we're really fortunate that uh, Claire and Jules have done a lot of thinking and, and work on this. Uh, and I just get to stand at the front and deliver the, you know, their hard work. So uh, that makes me look good, which is great. But actually the hard work's been done by them. So when you see them, please do thank them. Uh, so last week... If you remember, we looked at one of the, the, the sort of the primary principle of our midweek groups, and that's about the worship of God. So it's a bit of a recap with the fact that we first, when we gather together, we're a community of Christians. We're a community who worship the one God, uh, uh, and we come together in midweek groups to small groups to do that. It, it's about positioning ourselves uh, under his authority. It's about giving him giving him worship. But as we position ourselves under his authority and his uh, glory, we also reckon that, uh, we recognize that it's a leveler for us because uh, we all are equal in his sight. So there is, as the Bible says, there's no uh, free, there's no uh, Roman, Greek, slaves, yeah, men, women, they're all completely equal in the eyes. So there's no sort of uh, greatness when we, when we, when we, position ourselves under God, we realize it's a leveler. We all come together. Uh, and it binds us in unity. It recognizes that actually there is one church, one holy, catholic, and apostolic church, as we say in our creedal statements. And as we, we've explained before, the Catholic church is not the Roman Catholic church. That is a Catholic church. But the Catholic church, the holy Catholic church, is the holy, is the church the global, worldwide church. That's what Catholic means. It's the, it's the global church, uh, out of which we are just a tiny, tiny representation that gather here on a Sunday, and also in our midweek groups. So it binds us together. It says that actually we are all, e we're all not just all equal, but we all come together to worship the one. And we all do that in different ways. Some of us like to do it in loud and, and garish ways. Some of us like to do it in very quiet and uh, and, 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 and humble ways, and, and some of us like modern music, some of us like old music, some of us like no music, uh, and everything in between. And that's okay, because God makes us different. God doesn't make one model of anything. He makes everything different and unique, and he values that. So today's uh, principle that we're looking at uh, in our uh, midweek groups. The second inherent value that we want to instill at the heart of it is this. First of all, we look up, we worship the one. Then we look in, in that we, we look towards the, the, the group. Our midweek groups are our primary and frontline place for pastoral care. Pastoral care is this, it's an it's an unusual term. Uh, we, 
in, in, the, in chaplaincy, in, in all chaplaincies, the school chaplaincies, military, hospital, our responsibility is pastoral care. Uh, and you get this concept in the Bible, and the, 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 in, you, in Ephesians, you find these, the five gifts that are given to the church. Let's have a test. What are those five gifts given to the church? Apostle, don't steal them all, Robin. Apostle, you've had one. Now be quiet, we'll come back to you if, you get, if, if no one else gets them. Teacher, pastor, prophets, evangelists. They're the five. Well done. But actually, that's the only place you get this word pastor. Isn't that interesting? And yet, every American church leader is called pastor. It's only mentioned once in the New Testament, and that's it. Because the terminology that you get in the New Testament is nothing to do with this position of pastor. It's, it's far more common to be referred to as a shepherd. Shepherd is a much more common theme. You get the imagery of looking after one another. As a shepherd looks after his sheep, that's the common value. That's what it means to the sort of pastor or care. As a shepherd looks after his sheep. Uh, and, and, and again, in our, mes- in our Western understanding, we go, oh, I don't really understand that because, well, we don't really ever see shepherds nowadays unless you watch, you know, country, country file. And then you might see a shepherd then. But even then, that's not really, that's not a New Testament understanding of a shepherd. Because, you know, the country file shepherds, I mean, I don't watch country file very often, but when I do see them, they tend to go out, look after their sheep, round the sheep up with the dog. So they use the dog to round them up, put them in the pen. And then once they're they're in the pen, the shepherd will go home and sleep in his farmhouse during the night. That's not a New Testament understanding of shepherds. The New New Testament shepherds were quite lonely positions, lonely and lowly, both, because they would live with the sheep. So everyone thought they were a bit weird because they lived with animals. So they were already on a a back foot. But the sheep followed the shepherds, which is why Jesus says, if my, my sheep recognize my voice, and they go, oh yeah, we understand that, because... That's, the, that's our understanding of a shepherd. When a shepherd says, Flossie, come here, little Flossie will come bouncing towards the, the shepherd. You don't get that now with shepherds. Shepherds have to use a dog to run around and herd the sheep up because they're inherently scared of, <laughs> of everyone. But in those days, they'd built up such a relationship because they lived. It's this incarnational understanding. They lived with their sheep The shepherd was the leader of the flock, literally the leader of the flock. So when the shepherd says, right, we're moving, the shepherd would walk, would go in the direction where he wants him to go. And the sheep would, Flossie and his little friends, would would jump along behind them. So you get this understanding of a shepherd, something that's it's, it's incarnational. And incarnational is, is being present, it's living with, it's doing life with. So it's Jesus is, is the incar- is incarnated God. God come down to live, to do life with us. Literally, this, this, in John's gospel, it pitches a tent. The, the word uh, that, 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 that is, tra- the Greek word that's used is much more, is this understanding, he comes and pitches a tent amongst us. So, so he lives with us. And that's this incarnational presence. It's a pastoral responsibility. So you live, you do life with, but you care. You have a nurturing responsibility. And Jesus picks up on this understanding, this image, in some of his parables and teaching. And he, he says, when, uh, when in, in a flock of a hundred, when one is lost, he goes after the one. He leaves the 99 and goes after the one because the one that's lost is really important. So he, there's a... He, 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 He pursues the lost sheep to get them back into the fold, to get them back to be where they should be as part of the family that he looks after. So there's a responsibility, there's a care, there's a nurture for it. So that's that's why we say our our midweek groups are our primary source of pastoral care because it's a small group. So you should be doing life together. So you should be able to realize that if someone in your small group is at not is is uh, is not well or is is you know, things aren't sitting quite right with them, it's not on an even keel. Well, then 
we expect you to be supporting them, to encourage them, to pray for them. To, to, and then when you need to, you feed it up the chain into our wonderful pastoral care team led by Peter and Jennifer, who will then make me aware. And we say, as a wider church, what can we do? Because perhaps it's gone past your ability to cope in a smaller group, then perhaps we get involved. So it's, the, it's, about, it's about looking after each other. So this passage today is an interesting one. You think, well, that's not really what this passage is talking about. It's, it's not. But it helps us to understand this a little bit. So I think we have a romantic ideal of the New Testament church. We look at the New Testament church and go, oh, I wish we could all go back to being what it was like in the New Testament because then life would be rosy and it would be great. And you think, well, okay, we have a romanticism of what the New Testament church looked like. Uh, and passages like this perhaps don't help us because it makes it look great. I mean, it's virtually communism, isn't it, at its best. They give up everything, share everything. It's, the sort of, it's almost the purest form of socialism and communism. And it says, uh, the, 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 the Bible's words are, they were of one mind. That's really interesting, isn't it? One heart and mind here, because it makes me think that they all agreed on everything. And then I realized that can't be true, because they're humans. They can't agree on everything, because that doesn't make sense, because people just don't live like that. So it must mean something else when they're of one heart and mind. Well, what is it that, that, the, that, um, that Luke is talking about here when he's recounting the life of the early church? It doesn't mean that they just literally agree on everything, because we never agree on everything. Because even the, the, the simplest of details... The simplest things, what's my favorite food, is probably not the same as Annette's favorite food. The time that I get up in the morning is certainly different from the time Lorraine gets up in the morning. She is an early riser, I am not. She goes to bed early, I go to bed late. We are of different minds. People are different. So it must mean something else, mustn't it? So what does it mean? Well, I think what, it, what Luke is saying here, actually their core values, their core, their inherent things that they buy into, their vision and their values for what it means to be this new movement of, of apostolic, missional people, that's the thing they're of one mind about. The thing that God's called them to, they were of completely, they'd completely bought into it. They were 100% behind it, sold out, I'm in, we're going for this. How do I, why do I think that? Because Luke goes on to tell us that. By their example, you know, you know what they believe by how they behave. That's, that's really, you only really know what people really believe by looking at how they behave. Because in a, in a Greek understanding, a Hebrew understanding of, of belief, it was always demonstrated in action. Belief was not a head knowledge. Belief was a lived out reality. And so the way that they demonstrated this is, well, we're in for this complete, this missional, pro, yeah, missional task. What, is it got, what has Jesus tasked us to? He's tasked us to go and reach all nations for his gospel, to share his love. How are we going to do that? We're going to be in one small group in a community. We're going to, we're going to, to do that, we're going to need to empower it, and we're going to need to fund it. So every now and again, one of them would go and sell land or a house. Can you imagine I was to say, who's going to sell their house this week? Because, you know, we need a new whatever. And one of you would then have to sell your house. Mm. It's gone very quiet all of a sudden. <laughs> that's, that's, how, that's how committed they were to this, you know? They were really committed to this. They go, we're, we're, we're sold out completely. We're going to sell our house and bring it. And actually... Uh, and so I think that the thing that we want our midweek groups to be is 100% completely committed and bought into the values of what we're about here at Emmanuel. You know, to love God, to be a missional presence in where we are, and to, and to, and to love each other. That's what we're about. 
We want to see God's kingdom come, don't we? We want to see his, his will done here on earth as it is in heaven. The prayer that, that Emma took us through is not just a prayer. It's, it's a cry to God. It's our desire. It's the missional statement of the church. We want this to be the reality that we live in, surely. They were completely committed to the, the message, not just the vision. The message was simple. And again, Luke tells us this. The message is, well, Jesus is alive. That was the radical teaching of the New Testament. Jesus is alive. It's the thing that bound them together. They, they, they preached the resurrection of Jesus. He was a, God come to earth, died for us, was crucified, dead and buried, and three days later rose again and is alive today. That was their message. That was the thing that shocked the Roman Empire. And they kept the main thing, the main thing. They kept that, that simple, Jesus is alive. And it, you know, the early days of the church, there was people there go, we know this to be true because we saw him. Or we know this to be true because my mate who told me saw him. And they kept the main thing, the main thing. They didn't get distracted by details or, or minor things that, that, that infect the church today and drive schisms between us. They kept the main thing, the main thing. And they shared their possession. Why? Because everything, they really truly believed that everything they had came from God. Everything they had was God's gift to them, and therefore they were only stewards of it. They were not owners, but stewards. At the moment, I'm going to, I'm going to completely nerd out now. <laughs> I've watched it twice in the last week, or, or bits of it, not all of it, because they are epics. Uh, but uh, one of the channels, I forget which at the moment, is running the, the uh, Lord of the Rings series through. Uh, and, you know, that's nine hours of television. They're not all in the same day. But they've, they've shown the last one twice in the last week. Uh, so the Lord of the Rings, the return of the king. In the return of the king, uh, the, the land of Gondor, which is one of the lands of men, has a steward. He does not want to give up his position. A steward. He's steward, but not king. He's steward. He, doesn't have, he has no rights of ownership. He's there just to look after, maintain, and, and run the kingdom. But he doesn't own it. It's not his rightful. There is a rightful king. If you're, I'm really geeking out now. It's Aragorn. He is the rightful king. The steward of Gondor is not. They understood that they did not own this stuff. They were purely stewards. And there is a rightful king who does own it. There is a rightful king who does rule and reign. And it is not them. So they shared their positions. And in doing so, they furthered the mission. In Galatians, Paul writes that, the, that we are to, in Galatians 6.2, quick test, anyone? Carry one another's burdens. Well done, Mummy. Carry one another's burdens. The church is supposed to, to, to carry each other, that image of pastoral care in small groups where people have got problems, where people are dealing with issues, where people are being burdened by life. We are to carry them through this. Well, how do we do that in our small groups? We do that through praying for each other. But quite frankly, sometimes we pray for each other, but forget that in praying for people, God is shouting at us, you've prayed, now you are also the answer to the prayer, so do something about it, will you please? So with prayer also comes practice. You know, if people have got a problem, sometimes the Lord is saying to you, so do something about it. Carry one another's burdens. Don't just pray for them and expect me to sort out all the problems because I've already sorted out the problems and I've surrounded them with people to care for them. And it's you.
So pray for them. Put into practice ways to support them, to help them. Uh, And where you can't ask for help, one of the values of our pastoral care. Deal with what you can, ask for help when you can't. But also, this concept of practice goes wider than just, well, we're gonna, if people have got problems, we're going uh, to help them through it. Practice is also about sharing responsibility. So our midweek groups may have leaders, but we expect everyone to shoulder burdens of responsibility. This allows each of us to grow in our giftings. It's about sharing the responsibility. Why should just one person lead? Do you know, it's one of the reasons why I really struggle to be part of a midweek group. And I'm sure James would say the same thing. Because people look to us to lead, to know everything, and always speak and give the answers. It's really unhelpful. Because James and I don't know everything. Rarely do we have the answers. Uh, but we want to nurture other people to, to, to come up because God's equipped all of us. He's given us all of us different experiences and understandings we want to hear. And, and it's about sharing that responsibility. And, and, and so the midweek groups are an ideal opportunity and, and a space and a safe place for people to practice their gifts, to share responsibility of leadership, to share responsibility for, for, for each other's growth. And with that, we, we want to we bring in this value that we see this wonderful man called Barnabas, who, his name means what? Yeah, what's interesting is we don't know what his real name was. So, Oh, sorry, yes, we do know what his real name is. I forget, sorry. I did read this, honestly. But, but what's... But, What's interesting is they don't realize what his name is because they just start to call him. Do you know, because I said something earlier and I wondered if you picked up on it. What did I refer to my wife as? Yeah. Most of you are going, who's that? Because I never call her that. That's her real name, by the way. Uh, It's not Louise. Her real name is Lorraine. But I only ever refer to her as Lou. And on church suite, she's down as Lou. That's what people call her. That's what her friends will call her. But the bank don't. The bank call her Lorraine. Interestingly, in the church, Joseph gets called Barnabas. Why? Well, the answer is, is, is told. You are told the answer. Because he's an encourager. And so the thing that he's really good at, they just start to call him. You're not, you, you know, you're you're Barnabas, you're a fantastic encourager. We're, gonna, we're just going to call you that because we love that about you. And, if, and, and, and he's become renowned for that now. This little man, Joseph, who we know nothing about other than he sold some land, gave it to the church. The thing that we know about him is that he was an encourager and he was a great man to have around in a small group because he kept cheering people on from the sidelines. And he lived the walk you know, you know, he brought stuff to them and said, you need stuff, let me encourage you with this. I'm going to give you, go and make it happen. You know, sometimes I think the American footballers have got it right. Sometimes we do need cheerleading squads on the sideline cheering us on in life. I mean, maybe, maybe not doing cartwheels and everything. Cause, but we need people that will cheer us on and and. and uh, and it makes such a difference. Let me tell you a little story. Back in 2010, I ran the London Marathon. It's the only time I have run it. I think I'm getting to the stage now. I would like to run it again, but it becomes more and more difficult, I think, as the years go by. The London Marathon is quite special amongst marathons. If you run other marathons in this country, it's, it's all 26.2 miles. It makes no difference. The thing about the London Marathon is, with the exception of the, uh, the, the Limehouse Link Tunnel, which is foul. It just smells of exhaust fumes, even though there's no cars going through it. The whole route is lined with people. The whole 26 mile, and there's no pavement in the Limehouse Link Tunnel, so you have, no one can be down there. But the 26 
miles, let's say 26 miles of the 26.2, there's people on the sidelines shouting and cheering. And if you had any sense, you have your t name put on your T-shirt. So not only are they shouting and cheering, but they're also shouting and cheering your name. And I tell you, towards the end, that's what gets you across the finish line. <laughs> that's the thing that drags you those last three miles from the Tower of London and pops you across the mouth. Is the people cheering you on, it makes a huge difference. If that's what it's like for the London Marathon, do you not think that's what it's, we need those people in church cheering us on in life? Our small groups are a great opportunity for that because we get to know each other. We get to see each other's gifts and we get to cheer each other on together. We get to encourage people. And in doing so, we're demonstrating the love of God. Love is the, is the economy, it's the currency of the kingdom. And, and, and did not Jesus say, look, this is how you'll know that my disciples, by the way they love, love each other, that's, that's how you'll know, the way they love each other. So these are opportunities. It's an opportunity for growth. It's an opportunity to share each other's burdens, carry each other's burdens, to share the responsibility for pastoral care, to pray for each other in small groups and demonstrate the love of God within this little small community of faith. That's the second value of our midweek group. So we've got look up, the worship of God, look in, look after each other, pray for each other, look after the pastoral care of each other, encourage each other, and let them grow in the gifts that God has implanted in them. I said this week that we would have the opportunity. Some of you are not in midweek groups. So we have two new midweek groups, who grow groups that are going to be buying into these values. They're going to be starting up. Uh, they're going to be on a Wednesday, led by the lovely Johnny. Uh, who, that image was great uh, earlier, by the way, with you know, little Zeke. Because I've been down here with Zeke. Before, so I knew the state of his nose. <laughs> and yet Johnny, the dad, doesn't care the fact that he's really lovely top. The rugby top that he's gone is covered in snot because that's how much... That's the, that's the relationship that a father has. Picks them up, warts and all. Great image. It's, it's going to start on a Wednesday. And then Mary Joy is going to start on a Thursday. Mary Joy, is, it, which she always wears peach and, peach and pink, she's sitting here. Uh, that's going to be on a, on a Thursday. There are, if you want to sign up to be part of those groups, the sign-up sheets are at the back next to, well, just behind where Richard and Joe are sitting. I put limits on the number of people that can be in those groups. And there's a reason for that. So when you get to the bottom, if you're that last person, well done. If you want to get on and you've missed that slot, sorry, we're going to have to find another opportunity for you. But there are other spaces available in other live groups. We will find, come and speak to me, especially if Wednesday and Thursday don't work for you. And the reason why we put a limit on those groups is because we were expecting those groups to grow. And so we don't want those groups to already be maxed out with maximum capacity. Otherwise, there's no room for growth. What's the point of doing it? So there's a limit on those groups. So that's at the back. Go and sign up if you want to. Uh, uh, or go and speak to Mary Joy or Johnny afterwards. Get, some, uh, get to, to uh, speak to them. Get the, a little bit of a flavor of who they are, whether you think they're going to fit in. Uh, but we also have this, we want to develop this culture of try it. If it don't work out, try it. If you can do both Wednesday and Thursday, Try Johnny's first. If that doesn't quite fit, go and try Mary Joy's or go and try one of the other life groups that are meeting midweek. That's okay. We, we want to uh, exist in a no-guilt culture. Next week, we're going to look at our third value of our midweek groups. And then the week after that, harvests. We gather together to celebrate God's goodness and his abundance in his giving.